Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Haven Knox Johnston Winterizing Your Inland Boat webinar. Um, Haven Knox Johnston, we are a boat insurance company who've been around since 1986 um, under various sort of uh, different ownerships. And um, a couple of years ago, we were called MS Amlin, but are now back under our new ownership of Aston Lark as Haven Knox Johnston. We're very glad to be back. And um, obviously, uh, it, it, long may that continue. I'm, Joining us today for the webinar is our, is, uh, is is a surveyor, Ben Sutcliffe. Ben Sutcliffe has been around in the marine industry since God was in shorts. Um, <laughs> he's been. I have, he, I have had a haircut to make myself look younger, by the way. I believe your experience is over 40 years in the marine industry when you started in boat building and uh, of all sorts of types, GRP, steel and wood. And uh, you've been a surveyor for 20 years. You're an, a, a full member of the YBDSA or Yacht Breakers yep. Designers and Surveyors Association and uh, British Marine and the Inland Boat Building Association. Correct. Um, the webinar today is basically consisting of, well, it's going to be a mixture of video and chat. Uh, the video and chat section will be about sort of, the videos themselves about 20 minutes. So once we add in questions and everything, uh, probably about sort of, 30 minutes, 45 minutes for, the, for that. And then afterwards, we'll have a 15 to 30 minute Q&A session for any questions you may have that haven't been answered in the videos or anything you may wish to bring to our attention. Um, so on that note, I'm now gonna hand over to Ben, who is going to chat you through the various sort of uh, idiosyncrasies of winterizing your inland craft uh, for, this, for this oncoming season. So Ben, over to you. Good. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm probably going to throw a span in the works right at the start and, and, and ask people if they could just let us know as, as we go through this, how many are actually liverboards and how many are um, just regular weekend or week users or whatever, because it will be interesting to see what the sort of split is that we're talking to. Um, because generally with, with winterization of boats, we always think about it as uh, when you're leaving the boat um, at the end of the season. Now, the way the weather's going these days, people's extended seasons are continuing, but obviously on the inland waterway systems, we have quite a few stoppages, which do tend to mess up traveling around. But if we start over on the, um, over the side there with um, the, uh, the yeah, there, let's start there. Sorry, let's try and kick that one. This boat is um, in the winter and this shore power cable has actually been rubbing on the corner of the boat. And so it's really important if you're running shore power on your boat that you actually support it and, and properly protect it, you know, because something as simple as that, what we're on a metal boat. Yeah. <laughs> Doesn't take long for something to go seriously wrong with it. So things like that, make sure the shore power's in, make sure the, the deck socket is, is secure and watertight. And if it's an invulnerable area like this one is, I mean, luckily this has got a cover over it. But again, it's, it's really important to make sure that it's, it's plugged the right way around. And occasionally I have actually been on the boat where they've actually got the plugs damaged and water can get in the top of the, the socket and i mean that's hugely important also if that's running heaters or anything down below dehumidifiers that's and right sort of and your battery chargers yeah. to keep your bilge pumps running but more importantly when you knock yours out nine times out of ten you'll knock the whole <laughs> line of boats out so it, it can cause problems for marinas trying to find out where where the fault is but as i say this one's had a fault and then all i've done is tape it you can also see the here the cable's been trapped at some point um, inside so again it's probably not the most reliable cable to rely on when it's when it's clearly been kinked and, and, and damaged. Okay, so that that's um, a sort of typical thing that we see quite often, um, where boats have been moored up, and the lines have gone slack through the winter, and the boat has actually been held by the power cable, uh, and then you get sort of one or two bits of damage uh, occurring there. So that's um, quite useful. Thing to look at. Um, anything else on that one you want to chuck in, Paul, or shall we go on to the next one? I think we'll carry, carry, carry straight on. Okay. Lovely job. Okay, so we'll go to that one next, which is basically as you're winterizing the boats, it's important to be aware of these sort of areas that are kept clear and clear sure, so that they, they don't block up with leaf mold. We're accumulating in these uh, cutters. As you can see, here we've got some. Uh, one of the claims, look at this under here, look. This is all just building up and one of the claims that you quite regularly get uh, with, it, with narrow boats is if they've been left over the winter, the water comes down here, these cutters block and then all the water that uh, accumulates here on the deck ends up in the engine compartment and floods the engine. 
So it, something so simple like this debris being regularly cleaned and making sure these gutters are nice and clear uh, can cause thousands of pounds of damage very quickly. Mm. And you've had a few boats actually sink because of it. Blimey. Yeah. <laughs> All right. No, that's very important. Yeah, it is, it is a useful one, isn't it? Such a simple thing as well, isn't yeah. it? <laughs> and here we are on a nice boat and look, we've found that already. The boat obviously heals this way slightly because that's where all the water's been running and all the debris under this this here. And I suppose it accumulates over the whole se over the whole season as, yeah. as you sort of go yeah. places. And, and this one's not too bad because we've, we've actually got a, a, a tent pram hood on here. Mm. There's a lot of boats like the one next door to us who haven't got a lid or cover on it. So they will get leaf debris very quickly, you know, and, and block these very quickly. Um, coming coming on to that point with it, uh, it's really important if you haven't got pram hoods or cratch covers or whatever, to um, make sure that A, your bilge pump works and where it's fitted, the float switch works freely and doesn't get jammed because quite often I've seen uh, boats where the cables are running around the back end there or hoses laying on the top. So when the float switch eventually does lift up, it can't drop back down again. So it just completely discharges your batteries empties your bills the first time and then after that it, it's a uh, good night curtains type of stuff so it, it's really important to uh, keep an eye on things like that um, and, and again keeping uh, the, the paint coatings good around the gutters and don't let the corrosion build up it all it, it all helps with the freeing of the water all right any questions so far you're doing well no we're all good we seem to be good we seem to be covering ourselves here yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, or, or people have already gone to sleep already. So anyway, we'll have a bit more of a poke around the engine room now for winterization. So the first one we're going to look at is actually what you need to do with the engine. So, um, put things like the antifreeze in the engine. I'd like to say that I'm I'm actually uh, a lot thinner than the vo the video shows. <laughs> now, if you take so this is the um, uh, the uh, expansion uh, uh, tank for the uh, coolant water because. On, on narrow boats in particular, they, they all have uh, um, uh, uh, heat exchanger systems where the antifreeze runs in uh, and goes to the skin tank on the side. So anyway, we'll keep running the video, sorry. So for winterization, it's really important um, that things like the antifreeze and the engine are checked before we get to winter. Yep. Uh, in this particular boat, it's got a header tank here. Now, if you take the cap off, uh, it's actually it's quite low on water. Um, and we don't know what the strength of the antifreeze is, so it, using a hydrometer would give us an idea of how much strength the antifreeze is. But likewise, one of the things that a lot of people don't realise is that antifreeze, after about two or three years these days, becomes an, in, an aggressor. So it will and potentially can cause damage to your engine if you don't regularly change it every two or three seasons. Okay. So there's quite a lot there because you've obviously got the skin tank as well on the engine. So that's, that's quite an important one to do. And the water being low, is that an issue? Or? Well, yeah, I would definitely have that topped up before we start chugging off anywhere. Um, the other thing is, <clears throat> for winter, a lot of people, a lot of engineers prefer to see fresh oil in an engine so it's not sitting there with, with contaminants sitting in, inside the sump pump and everything else. Yeah. Uh, there's the dipstick there and there's the oil filler over there. And then likewise, the other one that you really want to try and think about is impellers. Um, a, a seasonal change on those, whether you do it at the start of the season or the end of the season really doesn't matter, but personally I would do it at the start of the season, uh, only because the impeller would have sat there for the four or five months not being used, crushed, so it's better to start that there. Better start the, the season with a new one. Yeah. New one, all yeah. right. The impeller is actually on the front of this engine, so you're in a really clever place in, in a particular boat like this, it's, it's quite awkward for someone to try and change it. You need to know some thin engineers on those ones. Uh, with, with, or with very long, thin hands to get to some of these things. And that's one of the biggest problems with a lot of the in engine installations on, on these sort of types of boat, is actually access to the important bits like water pumps and, and alternators. Good. Well, we'll, we'll um, kick on with stern tube. The stern tubes are actually one that uh, we quite regularly do claims on, uh, where they've leaked over the winter. The boat, we've got a proper traditional stuffing gland. So you've got a greaser here, which has been nicely filled up. So by doing that, you can actually turn the grease and force it down into the stern the tube. And you can see it going through the pipe, yeah. Now this one, you can actually see the grease is starting to push out through the end of the tube there, where the shaft goes through the gland. So it's probably just at the point now where it, it turns quite freely, so it's probably at the end of the season, well worth just nipping up the, uh, the bolts 
Uh, so you have to release the lock nuts to start with and just literally a quarter of a turn on each one to start with just until you get start to feel a little bit of resistance that is far too easy to push that shaft round really important to do because again important to do okay i'm trying to pause that there but for some reason it's not pausing on my end um it, if you guys can see this is the stern tube here with the bolts and they've got lock nuts so it's important that you um do these lock nuts uh, and uh, so you need two spanners but it's really important that you only do like a quarter of a turn on each, on each um, nut that's loaded to start with, just so you slowly pinch the, the gland packing together and then give the shaft a little bit of a turn and see if it's starting to have some friction at that point, that's the time to stop. If you find you're at the end and the, the, the gland and the, the abutment there are tight to each other, then you're going to have to get some repack, re, repacking, which is a, another story. Or going to talk to an engineer about having it done, but again, stuffing as much grease through the, the, the gland before you leave it for the winter, if you're not using it, will make a massive difference in the in the risk of allowing water to flow into this area. I'm trying to restart it. Has it restarted? My mouse has got a bit of a delay on this end of it. <laughs> Just relying on the grease isn't enough to force in. It needs to have the gland pulled down, and if you get to the point where your gland is wound fully down and it needs to be packing. It's, it's, some, some people are very... I just said that. Personally, I would <laughs> recommend doing that unless you really know what you're doing. But you need to pull the, the, the stuff back and you literally cut the uh, the, the packing rope uh, and make it into a constant loop with a chamfer on it to fit it in in one go. So it literally makes a complete ring and you put two or three of those in with the ring joints at different positions on it. But you know, adjusting it is a bit of an art. If you over tighten it, you can actually cause more damage than good because you'll actually overheat the gland. Okay, so that's the stern tubes. Um, like I say, it's, it's probably one of the, the ones that we, that and uh, cockpit drains are probably the two reasons, the highest two reasons that you have claims about sinking. And you know, as much as, as an insurance company, you're there to support people. Um, it's always a heartache when your beloved boat is just gone and swamped itself so let's go and kick just on with that, the back sorry sorry ben just sorry. a quick question that's just come in does the gland need loosening before reusing uh not if you've tightened it up correctly um there should be a, a, always a little bit of friction that you can but you can turn the 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 shaft through the the packing gland um th there should be a little bit of friction it shouldn't be loose okay Thank you. Great stuff. So let's kick with the batteries. And what about the batteries? Anything well, we should know on those? Well, batteries are always quite difficult to maintain um, because if you're not on the boat for long periods of time, trying to keep them nicely cycled, which is what most batteries like, is quite difficult. So if you've got solar panels which will keep them topped nicely is quite good. Some people have um, uh, battery chargers which have a system in, within them that will actually slightly cycle the batteries and, and, and slightly discharge them before it recharges. But you know the important thing is make sure they're clean and dry and there's no debris on the top of them. Okay, so that one I think has just done itself in, is it? Um, so with, with the batteries, again, keeping um, things... My, my dad used to love the old copper grease around terminals and make sure you've got plastic covers on the top of the terminals. Um, one thing I should also say is the fact that if, if you do... Uh, start looking at your batteries and stuff. Please have a look and see how close they are to exhaust pipes because we are having one or two uh, interesting conversations with, with claims where people have been running uh, diesel heaters and exhausts from engines for long periods of time and uh, they've run them over the top of the batteries which don't like getting particularly hot. Okay, so uh, I think we've just we've got uh, next title there, which is generators, I think. And just for the sake of completeness, uh, I know we've done the engine, I know we've done the batteries and we've done the, the stern guy, but what about generator on board? Is that just the same as the engine? or is Generators it generally, common? yeah. I mean, generators are literally the same sort of thing as an engine in this situation. It's important to make sure that oils are changed and, and antifreeze is correct. Oh, yeah. Uh, now, some people do have generators which are raw water dri driven on narrow boats, um, but normally most of them are through skin tanks, so it's important to make sure they have got the right antifreeze in them. All right? Perfect. Yeah, so if you didn't hear the volume earlier, antifreezes over the last 10 years have changed dramatically. 
uh, all to do with um, making things better for the environment generally. And one of the biggest problems with antifreeze now is that it has a, a definite shelf life where the inhibitors that stop the corrosion on the inside of your engine can become aggressors after about three or four years. So it's really important to uh, change your antifreeze at least every two and a half to three years. Um, it's an ideal opportunity to check the strength before winter. Um, and if it's old, change it. And likewise, you know, water pumps. Uh, and also don't forget your accumulator, um, and not your accumulator, your clarifier, where there will be a, quite a large amount of uh, coolant water running through that. So it's really important to flush that all out as you go along. Um, we're going to hit the old dreaded diesel bug next time. Diesel bug. This has come out of one of the, uh, the, the tanks. And you can see all this contamination in the bottom here and all the black. All that gunk <coughs> has come out of the bottom of someone's tank uh, from where it's just accumulated with all the water and helping it grow. And that could easily get sucked into someone's sort of engine. Yeah, well, it'll, it'll block the filters initially. Mm. But likewise, if you've got a diesel uh, heater on over the winter, there's nothing worse than running a diesel heater and then it, it, it's stopping because the filters are jammed. So it's, it's well worth getting a siphon occasionally, just pulling a bit of fuel from the bottom of the tank out to make sure it's clear. Um, and if you're running a diesel heater through the winter to keep the boat warm, don't forget to come and top it up. Yeah. That's another classic one everyone forgets. They've got these heat, but they forget to top the tank up. <laughs> okay, so with, with diesel heaters, um, there are enormous difference in how a DIY one is fitted to a professionally fitted one. Uh, a professionally fitted one always is fitted, so it will never take more than two thirds or three quarters of the fuel tank uh, reservoir. Uh, which again, as I say, can cause problems with the fact that if you leave the boat for long periods and the diesel heat is on set on a timer, then you're going to be emptying your fuel tank and allowing moist air to get into the fuel tank through the breather. Uh, and so it's really important to make sure that things like the uh, um, filler caps are well greased and the breather, the breather gauzes are not damaged. Um, so we'll hit the next one and, and that should uh, tell us all about that side of it. That's what basically causes diesel boat to the moisture in the, in the fuel. And another rumour, or another one that's been around the market a long time, is you should, you should always top up your diesel tanks for winter. Oh yes, that's a very good one. Let's go and have a little look at that, shall we? On most narrow boats and wide beams, the fuel tank is quite traditionally in the back end of the boat here. Uh, this one has got the breather on the top of the, uh, the cleat, and then you've got a separate filler here. Now this filler is very similar to the filler that's next to you there, where the cap is slightly recessed. So you've always got a risk of water getting in through the seals. The screws for the fuel tank are actually missing as well. Um, so water can get into that fuel tank. And then behind you, you've got another tank, which uh, we can probably pan over to, which has got the um, cap on top of a tube. And those are much better because there's less chance of the water being able to get into them. Okay. But one of the little things you want to look at winter-wise is, is make sure that the, uh, the breather gauze is actually in place mm -hmm. because if it's not, then obviously the water can get in. Okay, so that, that basically covers uh, the first set of um, bits and pieces to look at there. Um, with with uh, diesel, the quality of our diesel uh, across the UK is certainly the red diesel is not um, anywhere near as good as road diesel. Um, and, and there are a number of problems with the fact that with the bio element getting more and more, uh, once you've got the plant life growing in the fuel um, with moisture, it loves to grow. And, and so it's really good idea to do a diesel treatment, uh, like a, a diesel bug uh, treatment. I'm probably not allowed to say any names here as such, but there are some really good ones on the market and um, they will condition the fuel and... Uh, as the biocides will kill the stuff and it'll make it go to the bottom like it has in this uh, sample jar. Uh, and then you just need to use a vacuum of some sort into the bottom of the tank to pull it out. And, and regularly checking your fuel filters is, 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 is also really uh, essential. Um, but the most important things are to, to, to avoid diesel bug is, is to make sure your fuel tank filler caps are really good. The quality of the fuel you're buying is not like rubbish and that you always keep your tanks topped up as best as you possibly can um, and regularly change your filters. All right.
Yeah, Ben, we've got a question, question in on what are, what are your thoughts on uh, desiccant cartridge on the breather tube? Oh, yeah, desiccant filters. Uh, whoever's mentioned that, well done. Um, <laughs> the, the, the desiccant filters are really good. Unfortunately, most narrow boats, it's almost impossible to fit because most of the breathers are actually deck side. Um, certainly on, on what I call the normal GRP production boats uh, that you have uh, on, on the system, uh, where the manufacturers use a, a breather on the side of the boat and you've got a rubber hose running back to the fuel tank. Desiccant filters are great. Um, there is a, one particular company I, I, I'm dealing with at present. Um, they are finding that some of the desiccant filters become blocked and there's not a way of telling people when it's done its job and then it creates a fuel starvation. So as long as you understand the slight risks of knowing to change it regularly, uh, I don't see any reason why not. I personally love a desk and filter, and I've actually got one on my own uh, boat, um, which which has been very successful over the last three or four years. We've used it. Okay, this this one is actually a, 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 a gas locker um, that was actually virtually flush with the water line, and uh, all I ask is people urge people to if you've got gas lockers, whether you're on GRP boats or steel boats is, is once in a while yank your gas locker out before you leave your boat for a very long period of time chuck a bucket of water in the top and make sure it doesn't run out into the engine room like this one does because clearly it's not airtight to the engine compartment so any gas fumes would have uh, caused a massive problem this actual boat uh virtually well it didn't sink too far because it was only in two foot of water so it just sat down mm. on the bottom and, and flooded the engine room but basically um that gas locker was flushed to the water line, which is very common on many narrow boats we have on the system. Uh, and so basically the uh, the water came through in the middle of the winter and, and basically filled up the engine compartment. How's that? So we're gonna have a quick look inside the boat now for things to keep an eye on for winter. Always start in a good place to galley. Okay, so again, fridge is always best to leave open. I mean, this, the owner on this boat left it with a tea towel, which is great. So at least you're doing it and you're switching it off. The actual hop itself, there's really not a lot to do there. If being stainless steel, you could put a protective uh, coating on it if you wanted to. Uh, again, I'd make sure the gas is turned off at the bottles uh, if you're not living on board. Again, this one has got a nice vitreous uh, china. So again, it's really important to make sure that the water is empty. Uh, and don't forget the P-trap underneath. And uh, again, we, we ought to talk about the fact that boats unattended, we do get the occasional boat sink because of the fact that uh, the discharge pipe, which is just over there underneath the sink, will have water in it, it will freeze, and it will, it will blow itself off the, um, the fitting. And if the fitting is low to the water or there's a change in level in the system where the boat uh, uh, tips over on the side of the bank, then that will allow the water to come back in. So it's really important to make sure fittings like this one here are nice and clamped. This one's relying on the... I, I should point out to everyone watching that this boat, uh, the sink, because it was Fitchers China, was quite low. And so the owner had basically tried to keep his uh, discharge uh, uh, to the requirement of 250 mil above the waterline, which unfortunately wasn't possible. But what happened here is the fact that the hose then runs down and he's using a gold per pump to pump the sink out. But this area here is very vulnerable to freezing and it will blow uh, the fittings off if left uh, with water in them. Uh, a bilge pump water out because the, the discharge is quite low to the water line, really. That pipe is a bit kinked. Is that a yeah, that's not clever, is it? You can see that. Yeah, it wants a bit of work on it, doesn't it? You know? Paul was doing a surveyor's job there, look. <laughs> Okay, so that's uh, the galley area. Uh, this is a classic example of what happens when you don't drain things down. This actually blow the blew the mixer tap off because the whole uh, pipe was actually full of water. Okay, so we're into uh, stove. Now, a lot of people, I'm sure, um, may be liverboards, uh, and I can't emphasise how important it is if you're using a stove, uh, a multi-fuel stove, to, to be sure that it's operated safely. Uh, so we have a quick look at the video first and then we'll go from there. So with stoves, this is actually quite a nice installation. It's how many people would like to see them done now with the insulated flue. And it's 
dead upright so it's, 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 it's the best way of doing it. What you do need to have a look at on a regular basis, especially before you bunker down for winter if you're on board, is to make sure this rope here is in good condition because that create, basically creates a seal. The throat of the fire here is properly sealed off. There is also, um, on some of them, this one hasn't got it, I don't have a, a, um, a second plate on the back that's worth checking to make sure it's okay. And likewise, the fire bricks in this one are okay, so they're actually protecting it because they will get very hot. One or two people don't realise that some are only designed for burning wood and others are multi. It's really important to make sure that if you're buying a boat, you know what products you can actually burn in it. And again, if you're burning wood, just make sure it's really dry, because if not, you will make creosote. Okay. And again, make sure you've got a carbon monoxide alarm in the area where your fire is and also where you're planning to sleep. Yeah, I can't emphasise enough about the carbon monoxide alarms and uh, making sure they're properly done. Um, I quite regularly visit boats for pre-purchase where they don't have the insulated flues and they've got the normal uh, iron flue. Well, doing the rope and the, and, and the glass is important. With um, things like uh, when they're new, they need to be uh, warmed carefully the first couple of times to heat them slowly. And there is, most manufacturers will tell you how to basically bed the fire in because some of them, if they're cast iron or, 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 or plate, need to be heated slowly rather than just to go and have a first fierce fire because it will buckle or even fracture. And another thing here is the, the I, I go on a lot of boats, this one's got a hardened floor on here, uh, but quite often you see people with carpets here. And again, from an insurance point of view and boat safety, it should be a minimum of 300 mil from the hearth before you even put a flammable surface there. Right. So, yeah, this is um, a collar on the top of uh, one of the... Uh, um, stoves I saw. Uh, I actually have got a couple of really good YouTube rants on, on my own uh, pages but uh, i just always amazed that people think it's okay to live on board a boat with a collar in that sort of condition. I think the other photograph is even worse isn't it? Uh, yeah that's yeah the whole of the actual um, chimney wasn't actually sealed or bedded in properly onto the top of the firebox so any any operation that was going to be heaving fumes and, and, and carbon monoxide into the cavern uh, quite uh, massively. So I can't emphasize enough. The other thing is if you're burning wood, please do not stow it on the roof of your boat. Um, try and keep it dry. It's really hard work, but you need to be dry, burning really dry wood. Because as I mentioned in the video, if you, if you start to create things like creosote, what can happen is that can actually set fire to your chimney uh, or, or, or worse, all right? And that's, uh, yeah, that's when I lifted uh, the uh, removable um, chimney on the top of the boat. And that was completely blocked with all, all that creosote build up, as you can see there. OK, we're going to what we call the heads in boats, which is uh, the toilet areas. So again, we, we, here we are. We have actually got a vitreous slew here. So again, if you're leaving the boat for winter, any water that's left in the pan potentially could freeze. And because it's vitreous china, you know, they're not particularly thick, but it could potentially freeze and damage the pan or even damage the pump. So it's really important to make sure all these things are nice and dry when you leave the boat. And again, making sure the vents through, through the roof are all open. So you get a nice airflow through the boat. It's really important. You can see here we've got some water building up. This is a classic one what happens in the winter where you get this lichen building up here so we get this lichen building up here which then blocks the drains so then the water will build up in here and again if you get heavy frost it will crack the glass here or more importantly it will actually allow the water to run down in, into, the, uh, into the accommodation That's so just simple good. things like making sure the vents on the windows are empty yeah. And so many of these little tips we're doing today are really simple, but they make a huge difference uh, long term to the, uh, the, the, the interior of your boat. And then this is another classic one of uh, the, the tap had been left on, the water pump had been left on. Uh, it, the, the tank was actually empty, but the, the pump was still trying to pump water out. Um, 
<laughs> that's completely frozen like it had, as you can see there. So that's those ones. So we've got the, uh, the ventilation. I think ventilation is really important. Um, when I started in boat building, every boat we did, uh, when it came ashore for the winter, I used to have a hard back and a cover over and uh, a, a good tent, but everything inside, underneath the tent was left open to allow good ventilation through the boat. So let's just play this and we'll just show the importance of looking at the, the ventilation areas. Leaving your boat through the winter, it's really important to make sure you've got good ventilation. Uh, obviously, we've got the dome vent, uh, vents. This one here has got a lovely uh, double vent here in the door. And at the bow of the boat, we've got double vents again. So you've got low ventilation and, and high ventilation. So keeping ventilation and a little bit of background heat. If you're, if you're lucky enough to be plugged into shore power, where you can actually run a couple of little um, normal oil burner um, uh, radiator tubes, that's a great way of doing a little bit of gentle background heat on a thermostat. Uh, if you're using dehumidifiers, you've got to be really careful that you use a proper marine one and not one you bought from a DIY shop because they run in a different way. The ones you buy for houses rely on a natural background heat to start with to help dehumidify, whereas the ones on boats will work down to a sort of minus one and, and pull the air out, uh, the damp air out, out of the air, the damp out of the air. I'm so glad Kate uh, trimmed that bit out for me. <laughs> um, what I will say also is the fact if you're a liverboard, do not be tempted to start blocking up the, dry, the vents. You will not believe how many times I turn up on a boat and find that the, the, the low uh, venting and roof venting has been uh, stuffed up with, with dusters and God knows what else. It, 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 while you might think it's a, a really good idea, it's essential that you have proper ventilation for your own health and safety, and especially if you're running a gas uh, boiler or, uh, as we've seen there, a stove or anything like that. It's absolutely critical to have good ventilation in the boat. All right. We're doing well. We haven't got many questions yet. Then. <laughs> and is there anything to do with the holding tank while we're here? I'd always leave them empty when yeah. you're not using them, and I would flush put a, a, a loo flush into them, the blue flush into them, so at least it stops any smell. And again, hoses, a lot of people don't realise they have a seven year operational life. Okay. In interestingly enough, on that, that holding tank we just looked at underneath there, the hoses are not um, the sanitary grade hoses all the way through the system. Oh. So that's why it was smelling a bit. Ah, so yes, over a period of time the hoses, the, the, the aroma Porosity, can get out. Yeah. The porosity of them. Yeah, that's the word. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it's not part of wintering in that sense. No, okay. But pumping everything down. Um, I don't know what type of loo we got in this boat. We're going to have a quick look now, but again, let's make sure it's it's empty mm. uh, and dry. Because there's nothing worse than if it goes sub zero, it will crack the, the, the porcelain if it's a. Oh, uh, uh, okay. If it's a porcelain. So not just the pipes, it'll go through the. Yeah, if you haven't emptied the loo. Yeah, cool, cool. Well, let's go this way then. Yeah. Uh, I think we've been really lucky that uh, the last couple of years we haven't had long periods of frost. Um, but certainly we always get a cold, what my, what my dad used to call a cold snap around the middle of December and everyone used to get excited for snow at Christmas and then come end of January, early February, we always get a, a bit of a hard nip then as well. And, and it's really important to make sure that you, you keep an eye on those sort of things. Okay, what, what's the uh, next one now? The, oh yes, this is um, one of the seacocks we uh, took off a boat where this is more to do with... Um, inland waters with GRP boats, uh, where, where basically the seacock uh, fractured with the ice ice formed inside it. Um, and you've got the degalvanization there of fitting um, around these shoulders here. But that's quite a common problem with uh, these ZR fittings, uh, the fact that they only have basically a, a five year operational, safe operational shelf life. And some of the narrow boats as well have uh, generators where they have a mud box or an overall water intake. So again, just be a bit wary that when you come out for blacking, if you have got an underwater seacock of some sort, it's well worth making sure you change uh, those sorts of fittings on, on a regular basis. And Ben, on that, um, is it slightly different whether it's brackish water or, or fresh water? Or is there a slightly different time frame or is it the same for both? No, they're all, they're all sea marked for five years. Um, they're, they're basically these are brass, which is um, quite susceptible to uh, being stripped out in any sort of water. Um, 
and again, it's important, uh, we haven't really touched on it yet, but you shouldn't really bond them into the circuitry, uh, like shore power systems and stuff like that. Some people love bonding to anodes, uh, do not bond seacocks, especially DZR ones to anodes. All right. Okay, so we've got a couple of uh, things we had a look at uh, around the outside of this narrow boat. So let's, uh, which one do you want to start with? Leaves on the deck, is it? Sounds like the leaves on the track with British Rail, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> well, again, a lot of winter damage can be caused where leaves lay on the top of the deck and accumulate, so it stops the water freeing off the side of the boat. And this is a typical one where you've got the gutter drains on the side of the handrails and, and water has been held there, trapped there, and it's just starting to cause rust and corrosion. It's, it's amazing how much water being held on, on, on boats and certainly around the deck areas where you've got um, the flange fittings for um, like holding tank suction pump through the roof or um, like the chimneys we've seen, uh, the, the, the chimney flanges and other bits and pieces that are fitted on a boat. If water backs up and can sit around them, it, it will start causing corrosion and, and at some point it will allow moisture to get inside the boat. So that's a, that's a good one. Uh, let's hit the um, in, ingress one, the deck in water ingress, I suppose, while we're on that subject. Okay, Okay. so what about water ingress? Well, water ingress is a really common problem on any boat, especially when people start fitting uh, screws through the top of cabin roofs like this, and when you've got the vents like this. And quite often, uh, they will become loose mm. for one reason or another, heat, heat expansion contraction. Um, and, and then likewise, this one, if someone's been on the roof, running up and down, you know, hopping on off the locks, can easily get caught. And something as simple as that one little screw can allow water to run inside and then cause damage to the linings. Uh, and likewise, the, the dome vents, uh, you know, it's important to make sure they actually turn. This one's actually jammed. You can't oh, right. actually physically turn it. So the ventilation of that one from inside isn't particularly good. But um, over here on this one, this, this one's got a bit of a fiberglass roof on it. You can see there must be a bit of water ingress here because all this is breaking out. So the water's got in under the fiberglass. The water's got in underneath the fiberglass and it's yeah. starting to cause problems. And again, because they fit the fastenings like this to the tops, it's really not helpful. You know, all these sort of things are allowing water to get inside the boat. And, w and will that exacerbate rust and all that sort of thing? Well, this one's a, a wooden lid on this one. Oh, okay. So that won't cause rust on there, but it will certainly cause a lot of water damage inside the boat if it's not dealt with quickly. Okay, so really any fittings you put on, they need to have a proper uh, bedding mastic on them. As you can see around this dome vent, this has actually got a quite nice bead of mastic underneath the, uh, the flange here. But it's really important to regularly check them, especially just before winter, because it's so easy to forget. You know, you've got the clips here for the, uh, the pram hood. You know, they're all... These are not even been put down with any mastic underneath them at all. So there's nothing there to sort of stop any water ingress developing in the future. And how long does the mastic last, or how often before. should it be replaced? That's a good one. Um, probably four to five years, mm. just keep an eye on it. But it's more important to make sure there's no movement on them. If, if, it's, if it's moving, then it's time to change it. Yes. Yeah. You know, but it's more the fact that if someone knocks it, you know, that's when it gets caused. And likewise, if you come to repaint the, the shell in the future, all these things should be taken off, not just painted round. Yeah, makes sense. All right. And we always forget about snow, don't we? And snow, as it starts to thaw out, always turns into that sort of water, but doesn't run away. And things like the around the dome vents and that, like we've got here, this clip. This this is on a GRP boat, and basically that clip was loose. And with the ice uh, freezing, it actually it, moisture got into the deck, which was uh, got a balsa core deck, um, and basically allowed the moisture to get in there, and it actually expanded the deck. And the same with the deck fittings. If there's water between and it freezes, it, it will start to jack things apart and allow more water in. And a lot of narrow boats have uh, MDF linings and stuff which uh, unfortunately will get completely and utterly ruined with a bit of moisture. Okay, so where are we going to next? Surprise me. <laughs> Windows, yeah. Again, you've got in this window here. You can see into this window here. So this is exactly the same sort of problem with this window as the other one where you've got the, the moss and the lichens building up and this is the drain vent on the side here. So at some point this will all hold water in here and again although it's tough and glass uh, any freezing will do some damage to either the seals or the glass or even allow the water to come actually inside here as it builds up 
So it's, it's really important to make sure all, all these little things are nicely cleaned out. That was a nice simple one, wasn't it? And then obviously the window seals. Uh, so again, going into winter, this is a sort of typical thing you really want to watch out for, Paul, because, you know, this paintwork is actually broken away here. So moisture can get in between the paint and the lining and the seal. And again, it's a typical one. If we were to look inside, we might find some water running or moisture build up in that area because of something so simple as, as, a, as a broken paint film and a, and a, and a seal breaking down uh, behind it. So basically, in that situation, the sealant is not working because the water is going around behind the paint itself. Oh well, yeah, because what's happened is you painted the hull, you then put the bead of sealant on, then you push the window in. So the, the sealant is against the paint, so it's not actually mm. against the actual metal. If that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. I'm glad that made sense to you, Paul. With um, with window seals, it, it is really annoying because quite often people don't take the windows out and so that when they paint around them and paint around them and paint around them the, the actual seal of the window is completely compromised with all the corrosion underneath the uh, underneath the frame returns so uh, it's really worth spending five minutes just going around your boat and make sure uh, that the seal is good uh, with windows i should should mention there's uh, some really good products out there which you can use like a um a silicon gel or um, a soft wax which you can rub into little things like that which are really good to stop the, the and revive seals is really neat little trick. Okay, so I think the last one is copper covers, is it? I'm, I'm missing the one underneath here. Yeah, I've got two left, I think. Maintenance of um, nice uh, tents and stuff. Always doing a little bit of um, the silicon spray grease uh, on the zips is well worth doing because it actually will maintain them. And again, washing down your canvas and putting um, a, a, a waterproof on uh, that you can get from all sort of hardware shops and marinas and that sell nice nice products that will help help to, um, waterproof the canvas will always help protect your boat through the winter and again if your boat's the marina i mean a lot of marinas don't they uh, they, they do have a, a bit of a service where they'll keep an eye on your boat for you and, and make sure things are good but again it's really important to um make sure that if you're leaving your boat for a period of time that you, someone is checking it So basically, we've gone through about actually just physically locking up the boat, making sure that people can't get on board if you're leaving it for a long period of time. Okay, well, first of all, you want to be a bit sensible about where you're leaving your boat. Uh, lots of marinas have 24 hour security. Mm -hmm. Like where we are here in Devizes, they've got um, gate locks and the, lock, the actual locks to get out the, the main entrance are there in the evening. So this is a fairly secure marina. But again, it's amazing how many people don't actually leave their boat's locked properly. This one's got a really nice locking system and, and the door on the nice side of the aisle with steel plates. The boat next to us has got a duck hatch where they've actually got an external uh, clasp so that they've done that because a lot of duck hatches are the easiest ones to open because they just have a, rely on a little bolt inside and out you know and, and it yep. doesn't take very long for someone to give it a couple of rattles <laughs> and you can pry them open so that's good. The other, other thing I, I'm always amazed about is how many people when you ask them where, where the keys are they say it's in the gas locker Always. Always. It's <laughs> always, always in the gas locker. So find somewhere else to leave your keys. <laughs> yeah. Um, I can't actually think out of probably 400 boats, probably 300 of them keep the keys in the gas locker or in a sponge in a bottle in the gas locker or in the locker. <laughs> you know, it just amazes me. Um, I always say that if you leave your boat, uh, and you need to do that sort of thing, and you're in a marina, then please leave the keys of the marina. They're the, probably the better ones to keep the key with, as long as they've got 24-hour facilities. Okay, let's uh, go and hit the, uh, the one about how to make sure your boat's moored up properly. So, mooring lines. <laughs> These boats are only here temporarily, but it's amazing how many times people moor their boats up and don't think about protecting them. So we're going to have a quick look around at a couple of typical places where mooring lines chafe, but anything where it rubs over something like that you know you can see that line's already been chafing and that's just not from being here that's been moored elsewhere so it's really important remember the boats can be sort of 5 10 15 20 tons mm. and although there's not fantastic flow of water we do have a lot of flooding on a lot of the system where suddenly what is a nice quiet bit of water can become quite a torrent and we we we've both dealt with claims where uh, the boats have broken adrift because they've been tied up with something 
almost resembling a piece of string. Yeah. All the all the uh, all the spikes have been pulled out of the bank because they haven't been pushed into firm ground. So really make sure you regularly check things like that. Certainly if you're leaving your boat for a period of time and you've got neighbours who are nice, it's well worth making sure they keep an eye on it. And don't forget to put a telephone number in a window. You know, the number of times just something so simple mm. would, would help someone on the bank to try and phone you to let you know that they've just put your pins in for the fifth time today. That's a great piece of advice. Keep Leave a number just on a window on the bank side so that people can phone you in. Yep, yep. Or with friends or someone at local, mm. you know. I, I can't tell you how many times I've seen on the on the local forums um, about the fact of uh, there's a boat drifting down this bit of uh, canal. Does anyone know it? And, and it's on forums. Whereas if someone had some way of contacting each other, it would it would make a lot of sense to help people. But if you are leaving your boat for a period of times on bank sides, especially in the winds, just be aware of how soft the uh, the, the towpaths become. And, and also the way the boats yaw up and down. And, and if there is flooding, you know, I've been to one or two areas where the water boards have had to dump excessive water into the canal system to deal with the fact that reservoirs were flooding and, and put, a, put another two and a half feet of water into the system, uh, which, which can't be handled very quickly with some people's boats where they're moored. Sorry, Kate, I'll just keep going, sorry. I'll like that and pass through and you see the oh. in chafing from previous. I think it's time to change that rope. See where it's rubbing on the boat there. This one's actually not too bad, but sometimes I've seen them rubbing like that, or rubbing over something sharp. You turn them over and you actually see the, the cables inside. And avoiding the uh, shore power cables actually going into the water is really important. I have actually seen boats where the mooring cable and the power cable are actually through the eyelet like that. In this case, it wasn't the case, but it always makes me amused <laughs> how people tied 20 ton the boat up with, a, with an electric cable. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> so I think we're on to where we're up to now. Yeah, winter covers, as I was talking about at the start, if your boat's ashore or, or you wanted to put a cover on it, it's a great idea, but just make sure there's proper ventilation at the start, at the front of this boat, it's all completely folded over. So although the boat is beautifully protected with no ventilation through it, and this boat is a wooden boat, uh, it can suffer really quickly from, from, uh, from the fact of no ventilation can get through the boat to, to keep it in good condition. I think we're there, are we? Well, I would like to first of all say thanks to uh, Devices for allowing us to Devices Marina, uh, Alex and, and everyone there, and Tom and, and Heidi for allowing us to use their boats to start with. And and, and also a huge thanks to the cafe at Mar oh, uh, the cafe. Marina who did that really rather good cake and coffee, I have to be honest. Beautiful cake. <laughs> yes, well worth stopping there. <laughs> <laughs> right, we're going to open up the floor. If um, anybody has any questions, please raise your hands. We will then mute you and feel free to ask or to type in a question. Has anyone got any questions? Uh, okay, one's come in. If you are hooked up to mains power, should batteries be isolated? Um, when they ask that, they mean... Should the batteries be isolated uh, when you're not on the boat? Or I'm assuming it's when they're not on the boat. So yes, you should have everything isolated. The battery charger will still charge the batteries, but it's also important to make sure if you do isolate your batteries and you're not with your boat, that your bilge pump is wired separately. So it will still uh, pump from your, your main system. Um, so that I hope answers that one. Uh, you should also have a galvanic isolator. Ideally, the best way to protect yourself from stray currents is from having an isolator transformer. Well, I hope that's answered that one. I hope so too. I'm sorry <laughs> if it hasn't. I, I'm, I'm just assuming you mean when you leave your boat for periods of time. 
And and another one just coming in. What about when everything sort of warms up again in the spring, when we get back to the boat for the first time? Is there sort of things we should be checking and all that sort of thing? Ooh. Are we going to do a spring webinar? I think we're going to. I think, I think we might have to. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean, basically, it's a reversal. I mean, to me, uh, if you're not staying on board your boat, taking as many of the soft furnishings off. And leaving all the locker lids open and stuff is a really good move. So obviously, when you're coming back to the boat in spring, uh, making sure everything is okay like that and starting to re, re, refit the boat out is, is good. Um, and again, checking things like the, the lockers uh, and the gas lockers in particular, uh, and also your fuel condition um, and going through those sort of things are really important to, to, to do. And, and so and with regard to restarting up the engine and things like that, anything like that? Yeah. So with the engine, depending on what level of winterization you've done, um, I mean, some people, do, I mean, there's, there's such a different opinion on things like, do you stuff a, an old sock in the end of the exhaust pipe to stop condensation going inside the engine? I, I would rather say it's far better to go down to the boat at least one, once every three or four weeks and physically turn it over and make sure it's running and give it a good 20 to 30 minute run. Um, but that first initial turnover is really important to make sure that you don't just turn it over and leave it. You just want to slowly turn it over uh, and make sure that nothing is seized like a valve has got stuck or something like that. But most of the modern engines are pretty good. Some of the older engines, you do have to be really careful to make sure that things like valves and piston linings haven't got excessive corrosion, which can create a ring or something inside to go. But again, making sure you, before you start the engine, your oil, oil levels are right, your water levels are right, a visual check around the engine, make sure the belts are correctly tensioned. Um, you know, sometimes, you know, I, I, give an example, I, I've just done a, a, a thing uh, on a project boat, which hadn't been started for two years. So I literally put a, a span on the, on, the, on the crank and gave it a little turn to make sure that uh, the engine actually rocked over before we pressed the start button. But a lot of narrow boats, it's very tight to actually get to the front of the boat. So things like that. All right. Well, your timing is very, very out on that. We've just had another question coming in about along the lines of a spring seminar. What about a post COVID left for two years plus check? Well, what, what do you see after long, long winterization sort of thing? Two years. It's a yes, I would. If I've left an engine for two years, I would definitely go for. Uh, turning it over manually before pressing the starter button uh, to make sure that you can feel that it, it will turn by hand. It, on, it, it's not as bad as it sounds. The right size uh, spanner on, on the on, on the uh, on the flywheel at the front will normally do it. I mean, sometimes if you're very lucky, you can grab that. Obviously, if you can do decompressions off on the older engines, great. Uh, but on the modern engines, if you if you can get hold of the, the drive pulley belt, sometimes you can rock the whole engine just by pulling those belts backwards and forwards slightly, which will give you an indication of if it's seized. But again, I would always, definitely two years. Fuel, um, you almost certainly have to change your fuel. Um, you, you could take a couple of samples out of it with a siphon just to see what colour it is, um, but you'll be quite gobsmacked at how quickly fuel will deteriorate, especially if there's any large amount of air in, in, the, in the tank, which will allow moisture to accumulate. Uh, and certainly filters, uh, oil filter, fuel filter, I would certainly give it a complete flush and, and redo the oil, flush, flush the oil systems and, and, and obviously change all the coolant systems as well. Don't forget if you've got a clarifier to make sure that system is, is forced through and, and flushed as well. <laughs> there's quite a lot there's quite a lot to do there. <laughs> batteries may be an issue at two years because if they haven't been cycled as we talked about in the videos they can be a bit of an issue cool, cool. okay uh, not not a winterizing question but how often should the flexible butane gas hose be changed that's a great one okay i personally believe that you should never allow a butane hose uh, the orange ones uh, and the, the black ones uh, should be changed at five years from fitting. The problem we have is, like, I went to a boat a couple of months ago, and I think the boat we looked at um, had had a new gas hose on, but the gas hose date supplied from the fitter was actually a year older than the date of fitting. So it's, it's knowing when the, the gas has been first passed through the hose, because 
the trouble is, uh, and I don't want to be too controversial here, but the expectations, people look at a hose and say it's fine, but unfortunately gas, uh, the propane in particular, will rot the rubber from the inside and make the hose porous, and you can't tell that. And again, it's, really, it's a good question because uh, so many times you'll see um, orange hose used to, to connect to the back of the cooker inside the cabin area. And it, it's all hidden behind worktops. And it, it honestly, I just sometimes it beggars belief that how people don't think about what's going on. You know, the gas hoses are, and our houses are so thick walled and, and made in such a way that with the North Sea gas that we have in the UK, that uh, I assume it's North Sea gas or is it from somewhere else these days? Um, <laughs> but, but the gas hose in your house will do a 25, 30 year service life, but the hoses in your boats are really five years and really again if you've got um any sort of form of cooker that moves whether it's one you can pull in and out on the back of a chain or whether it's one that's uh, for some reason gimbaled uh like if you've got a, a motorboat or a yacht that's sitting on the system somewhere then that cable should be an armor hose as well and it always comes with a date on it perfect Good question thank you uh, water tank should you put a cleaner in or bleach uh, um Right, good question. I personally hate drinking from iron or steel water tanks. Stainless steel is okay. Uh, I grew up in the days when we had fiberglass tanks and uh, I've been suffering from it. Uh, I actually ended up with some uh, bladder cancer, which they think was probably caused by it. Um, but certainly, if you can lift the lid on your water tank, that's the first thing I would definitely be doing is lifting the lid and seeing the condition of the tank. Uh, to see how uh, what the condition of it's like. Uh, if it's if it's mild steel, it will be corroding at some point, so you need to make sure it's properly cleaned. Um, there are things like uh, the Milton tablets and there's water purifier tablets, but I would also go down the line of definitely sticking a, a water filter on and making sure you change the cartridge every three or four months, or preferably drink from plastic bottles. You know, drink from uh, um, uh, bring your own drinking water and boil everything else. Uh, I once did a survey <laughs> where the customer didn't have a water tank. He just put the kettle over the side and dipped, dipped the, uh, dipped the uh, end of the kettle uh, and then asked me if I wanted a cup of tea, at which point I said, no, so I, oh, I've got some water. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, yeah, yeah, it, I'm sure I, I'm not a great one for bleach, but there are proper um, uh, uh, tablets that you can use for that. But start with making sure the tank's clean. Always a good also your hoses, sorry, Paul, also your hoses. Um, most people have the, 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 the proper push fit pipe work or copper, but I have been to one or two people who seem to rely on using garden hose, which is actually really bad news to drink from, drink through. So um, the tank is the least of your worries at that point because those are not safe to drink from. And I've been on quite a few boats where DIY fit outs have used garden hose. And the most important thing from all that is don't fill your kettle up from the canal. There's a good start. Uh, any advice for people using lithium batteries when the temperatures drop? Right. That we're, challenging, good, we're challenging you now. <laughs> that is a good one. Lithium, I don't have what I call a huge amount of experience from lithium. Okay. Uh, don't see them that much on the system. But I did look at using them on my own boat, but I, I, um, I don't use my boat enough through the winter because uh, it's out in Corfu. And we decided against using lithium for that one reason of the fact that they were potentially quite vulnerable to low temperatures. So um, what I would recommend without giving bad advice is speak to the people who supply the batteries and take their advice, but I do know there have been problems with lithium where it gets quite cold. And they do like this cycling, so if you are leaving them, it's important you, you get a, a, a charger. Um, my own charger has got the options where it tells you what type of batteries you're using, and you click in and you switch it to that, and then it will do whatever cycle the manufacturer set up on the charger to maintain those batteries um, to a better performance. And when you say low temperature, what sort of low temperature are we talking about? 
Well, I think anything under five degrees, um, but as I say, I, I'm not qualified enough. Um, I'm a GP, I'm a surveyor. Uh, <laughs> and I'm not trying to cop out from the question because it is a very good question and something that I'm glad someone has actually thought about. Um, and I'm not sitting here with a mobile phone suddenly Googling, Googling an answer for you. But what I would say is oh, who's making battery you've got and I would actually speak to their helpline and ask them what is the correct safe uh, operation temperature and how do you protect the batteries because you've invested an awful lot of money in lithium. Um, the boat I bought used to have some quite expensive batteries and they'd only lasted five years because of that problem, which is why I went away from lithium myself. I couldn't see myself lasting 10 years to get the money back at the time. <laughs> Uh, so, so, so that's really good advice there. Um, thanks for that. Um, how did you deal with draining down the engine when the boat has an outdrive and no coolant? Right. OK. I don't know if the boat is out of the water or not, but if the boat is out of the water with an outdrive, the inboard engine will have drain downs around the unit. And I'm not sure if we showed the photograph of the cracked head uh, or not, um, maybe for tomorrow's one, but um, we have got somewhere a photograph of a cracked head of a, an engine that was used on an inboard uh, with, with a drive leg. So basically, if the boat is out the water, uh, what you can do is you can put a set of what's called earmuffs onto the water intake uh, and then use uh, tap water to start with to flush the engine through. And then once you've done that, so you've got rid of all the rubbish that's been around the engine, so it's good flush for 20 minutes, then you allow the engine to naturally drain off through the exhaust. You can then look to go to where the water pump is and you can take the hose off from the water pump. Bear in mind, this is with the boat out the water. Take the, take the hose off from the, the forced side of the water pump. You would take the impeller out for the winter anyway. And then you do an antifreeze mix of 50-50 uh, through a funnel on a hose up high, pour it in and let that run through the system. And then on most, I uh, say so almost, almost every Z drive engine I've ever seen, there will be at least three drain downs on the casing, and normally one of them will be on the. Uh, uh, no, that's the um, that's the O wing case. There's another one there somewhere I get sent you. Uh, that's the sail drive. Uh, where is it? Um, it's a sail drive, not a Z drive. So the Z drive is the. It, I sent you a photograph with a, a crank with corrosion on the side of it. But there will be proper drain downs on the side, and, and the reason why it's so important to flush is because. It, with running boats on inland waterways especially you will pick up silt and what happens is the waterways get blocked with silt and even though you think you flush the engine you will then find that uh, in the winter even though the engine is drained down it can crack because there's silt in the engine and actually believe it or not in the Mercruiser uh, handbook it actually says to use uh, wire in through the drain holes to agitate to make sure you have have removed all the all the debris from the, the, the actual uh, casing of the engine. Does that help? If the boat's afloat, if the, uh, there you are, that's the crank on the side there. So basically, that that crack that fractured, but right down just where my thumb is on the bottom side there is actually a, a drain hole, which uh, is a core drain, which could yeah that's it there. And there's another one above uh, uh, where just above the fracture, which was another one. But um, there are core drains on them. Um, if the boat is afloat, obviously a lot of uh, drive drive leg vessels don't have a shut off um, to to isolate the water coming in from the drive leg, which I've always thought is a bit of a bad design. Um, so personally, I would say to start with, if you can, when the next time the boat's out of the water, do that. But again, you you can um, try and flush the engine as best you can but you can't leave the core drains out with the boat float. You just need to make sure you add some heat and regularly turn that engine over. Does that answer the question for that one? I hope so. I hope so too, and I'm really sorry if it doesn't, but it, it is an absolute nightmare um, winterizing um, Z drivers afloat. 
and also the uh, and just someone someone's message in saying and how do you check the strength of the antifreeze uh very good question first of all if you know it's over two or three years old you don't need to worry about the strength just get rid of the stuff okay <laughs> yeah because it's going to start being doing damage to your engine without you knowing it if it's over if it's under three years old um basically you use a hydrometer a battery um not a battery one a, a, a hydrometer for antifreeze um, all the automotive uh, shops sell them. You can buy them online as well. And basically, you, you're looking for at least a at least at least a 45, 40%, 45% strength minimum. Um, and again, it will tell you what that goes down to in temperature wise. On my own own boat, where I keep it, uh, I, I I do mine every year because I, I'm. I change the water pump every year. So as soon as I take the water pump out, um, the water pump impeller out, I uh, I do lose a bit. And um, so I change that and I then re-top up and I just check the strength of it. Uh, and again, with antifreezes, depending on the make of the engine, uh, I nearly got caught out with this one myself. I, I bought a green glycol uh, for mine. And when I spoke to B the Marine, they said, oh no, you need to use the blue one. Uh, and I can't think what the name of the blue one is, but uh, thanks thanks to them, I then had to go and take the other stuff back and make myself look like a really chump by saying, I've actually bought the wrong antifreeze. They said, no, no, it's the only antifreeze we sell here in Greece. I went, no, 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 I need the blue one. And so I end up having to spend about a day and a half hunting around all the different places to find the blue one uh, for what difference it makes. But there must be something different in it that affects the seals and the rings of, of aluminium engines and stuff like that. Cool, thank you. Uh, next question. I have a desiccant dehumidifier. Should I leave some ventilation on? Now, that is the one I think that is purposely made for the marine use. I have to go and check my notes uh, on that. But basically, if you're running a dehumidifier, ideally you should have a little bit of background heat and no ventilation because the whole point is you're trying to dry the humidity out of the air. If you're using the other type, then yes, you should use some ventilation. So um, if, it, if it is a proper marine use, uh, I, I would never use a non-marine dehumidifier to start with because we've, we've had a few of them catch fire where they've overworked uh, in people's boats before now, which has always been an interesting one. When you find they've got this thumping rate with dehumidifier that uh, should never have been in a boat to start with. But I think the Descant one, um, I think is the right one, uh, but I would need to go and check that. And do you, do you need to do anything to central heating, antifreeze in water or drain down or? Right. Well, yes, your antifreeze, uh, your heating system should have um, uh, an antifreeze uh, type uh, product in it because it's just as susceptible to freezing in the boat when it's not on. Okay, cool. Um, and next on, we have a GRP sailing boat on the Norfolk Broads. It will be out of the water for this winter. After our cleaning, polishing, etc., do you have any recommendations for anti fouling for fresh waterways? Um. <laughs> <laughs> Oh dear. Um, there are the first thing I would always say to people is if you're putting new anti foul onto old anti foul, find out whose make of anti foul was on there first. Because one of the worst things as a surveyor I see when boats come out of the water is the anti fouling hanging off everywhere. Because basically, there can be massive incompatibilities between products. So Unfortunately, to start with, I would always say find out what product you've got on there if you've only just bought the boat. If you know what product it is and it's not working, look for something else within the range by that manufacturer um, or check with your chandlers as to which anti fouls are compatible with the one you've already got on your boat. If you're stripping back to, to fresh, so back to bare GRP, uh, obviously you, you need to use some proper etching and primers to start with. And then really it's, there is no, no one in particular I can recommend, but you know, there are three or four very good manufacturers of paints and antifouls out there. It's a matter of making sure that what you put on is, 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 is suitable 
but also doesn't harm the environment too much these days. We're, we're trying as much as possible to reuse materials that don't damage the environment and the waterways. Yeah, and, and, um, but, but there is a different style for um, fresh water and seawater, is there? You can get yes, different. Yes, there are yeah. different anti fouling's. There are different fouling's available. Um, and and believe it or not, I mean, this is this is an absolutely classic. I come from I come from East Anglia. I grew up uh, in, well, in Phoenix the Ferry, but I did do my apprenticeship at Alton Board, uh, which basically used to have Lake Loathing, which was salt, and boats used to go up into the the Alton water, and that would be fresh and you'd find that the boats that came in really full of uh, weed from the salt water would go into Pegasus Yacht Harbour in the old days and within a day or two all the fouling that was on the salt fell off and, and they, they'd have a lovely clean bottom for a couple of weeks before it started growing with what, what's in the fresh water. So there are different types of anti-foul. Uh, I'm not a paint specialist uh, probably people are wondering what specialist I am at this point, but um, basically it, it is important to use the right anti-fail for the type of boat you're on um, and, and the type of water. But I mean, the, the ironies are that awful lot of boats on the inland waterway systems, certainly all the, all the narrow boats, are not anti fouled at all. They literally chug around with a blacking or an epoxy tar on them and don't have anything. Um, you know, so it really is, it, it doesn't need to be a particularly strong anti foul in, in fresh water generally. And, and I know, and this is going to seem like an obvious question, the, you know, the, you've got the fresh water on the broad is going to be different from the fresh water in, in a canal that's going to be different from on the Thames and all that. So there's going to be a sort of a, a sort of big mix in amongst that lot as well. Massive, massive mix. Um, it's no different to when you're doing coastal sailing. What anti foul works really well in East Anglia is absolutely hopeless sometimes. Uh, on the west coast you know uh, and and because you have different sea temperatures and different uh, uh, levels of salt in the water with the Norfolk boards there is one little exception which is the fact Braden water goes to Yarmouth which is then salt so you have got to be a little bit careful about what we're talking about here as to what type they're in but generally speaking I would start with a the, the anti-value you've got make sure you know what make it is see what's compatible if you are not happy with the anti value you're using and you want to change, you need to check with the manufacturer, the one you are using, how compatible it is with the oppositions manufacturers make and what barrier, like a primer, you've got to apply between the two. What you cannot do is if you've got an eroding anti foul, is put a hard anti foul over the top of an eroding anti foul and it's got to come off. All right. And just be really careful how you're taking it off that you don't use uh, orbital sanders and stuff like that. We actually had a claim. Where someone had sanded all the anti foul off their boat and it had uh, drifted in dust across three or four other people's boats. So please be careful. <laughs> and uh, I think we've got one more question. We've got time for one more question. Um, should cabin bilge inspection covers be left removed to improve ventilation below the floors? Every bit of ventilation you give to your boat is fantastic. I love seeing with, with my own boat, because um, we leave us for quite a period of time. Each year, we lift, we lift every locker lid, every bilge lid, everything's dry. Um, and we've got lovely ventilation. We've got the old doll vents on the front of the boat, which we, we try and work out where the prevailing wind is from where the boatyard's left us. So we turn those round in the right direction just to try and catch a little bit of extra wind to, to force through the boat. So there we go. And I think, <laughs> I think this one's coming from a friend of yours, because uh, apart from working abroad, how does a surveyor keep warm on those depth of winter pre-purchase surveys? <laughs> Plenty of Mars bars, tell him. <laughs> <laughs> and Welsh cakes. Mars bars and Welsh cakes. There you go. Yeah. There's, there's, there's the top tip for keeping, keeping warm in winter. There we go. Yeah. Um, I think that's it. That's all the questions. Um, I think it's, I think been, it's great. been great. I'd love I'd like to say thank you to Kate and Chris at Knot for all the filming and a huge thank you to Devizes Marina, as, uh, as nice Ben too. said. And also thank you to you, Ben, for all your expertise and answering all our questions. Um, well, I don't feel I'm that much of an expert with some of those questions, and I do apologise, but sometimes you have to be honest with people, uh, and that's one of the things I've always prided myself and my father on, is if you don't know the question, don't give a stupid answer. Check with the manufacturer, because <laughs> the questions are very good questions. So thank you. That's really good. I'm glad our customers have challenged you. <laughs> thank I've you very much, everyone. Now. So thank you very <laughs> much, guys. And, and thank you very much for actually bothering to come and, and listen to us.
No, thank you very much from Haven as well. So um, we'll leave it there. Thank you very much, guys. Cheers. Ta-da.